if you want to see what's happened to front end alignment. This week's field trip is to a place where they make piano rolls. Not the edible kind. But first, David's been working on improved jello. You know, jello tastes pretty good, but it's not very strong. Acme School's been working on this problem and came up with this solution. If you put some string in the jello before it gels, you get jello that tastes good and has quite a bit of strength uh, in one direction. Okay, I see that look on your face. What's this got to do with anything? Well, this affects commercial aircraft, cars, the space shuttle, and your tennis racket. See, since the middle of the century, we have a new toy to play with, composites. Strictly speaking, a mud brick with straw in it is a composite material. In order to differentiate modern science and mud bricks, the new materials are called advanced composites. And as long as we're speaking strictly, I feel compelled to point out that the technology of modern composites dates from the turn of the century. A person named Bakelin discovered that the addition of wood fiber to phenolic resin resulted in a strong, hard, tough material. Bakelite. Composites really took off in the 50s with fiberglass. It's glass-reinforced plastic. All advanced composites have a matrix and a reinforcement. In my first example, the reinforcement is string. The matrix is jello, orange. There's a flurry of research going on using metals, ceramics, and polymers as matrixes and as reinforcements. At the moment, though, the most common composites have a polymer matrix. Most plastics are polymers and vice versa. The hottest reinforcements are glass and graphite. The reinforcements don't have to take the form of the string in my jello. They can be added as particles, fibers, flakes, or whiskers. The exact properties of the composite don't just depend on the two materials used either. Their interactions part of the story. Some materials form a strong mechanical bond with each other. Some bond chemically. And some interactions are even more subtle. Half this plate is coated with a silicone spray. Watch how water interacts with it. The uncoated side is getting wet. The coated side makes the water form into beads that don't wet the plate. You can see this effect on a newly waxed car. But the effect doesn't happen only with water. Some materials will wet others, and some won't. So the type of bond contributes to the range of strength and flexibility in the final material. And by juggling all of this, I can figure I can make this jello do anything. First, I can play with the characteristics of the jello itself, you know, more or less gelatin. Then I can play with the placement of the reinforcements. I might try this direction, this direction, or this direction. I could introduce the reinforcements as um, netting. I could try short, randomly placed pieces of string, whiskers. I can play with the characteristics of the string itself. Uh, metal string, I guess that'd be called wire, would be springy. Plastic string might give me more stretchiness. Other types of reinforcements can have the same physical characteristics, but the way they bond with the jello can change my composite's performance. Now, after I spend 20 years trying all of that, I can start all over again by replacing jello with something else. Now, all this is actually pretty exciting, but the real thing that's getting everyone's attention is the fact that, for the first time, the properties of materials can be tailored to suit the engineering requirements. These fishing rods are a good example of tailoring the materials to the job at hand. Weight, flexibility, and strength can be tailored to give a range of rods, you know, for different tastes, different fish, and different conditions. Furthermore, these materials have been designed to assume the shape of a fishing rod. Officially, this is a Kevlar graphite composite. But by choosing the way that the two materials are knit together, it becomes a fishing rod, ipso facto. This is tricky to achieve with bamboo. Snow skis have also taken to composites, like a duck to water. Skis are made for different types of snow and different types of skiing. Shape, weight, vibration damping, flex, and a whole lot of other things can be optimized instead of compromised as they would be with, say, a piece of wood. Incidentally, I don't know a whole heck of a lot about snow skiing, so I hope I got that right. The de Havilland Dash 8 aircraft uses a lot of composites to gain a 25% fuel advantage. Moving into the future, 
Watch for metal and ceramic matrix composites to gain speed. There's already a Toyota with metal matrix connecting rods being shown. And ceramics can withstand very high heat, but they tend to be brittle. The use of reinforcements in ceramics as crack stoppers alone might give us everything from ceramic engines to ceramic composite frying pans. What does this mean to you? Well, now you know what all the excitement's about. And with the knowledge I've gained, I'm going to keep working on stronger jello. If one day you see an entire car body made from jello, remember, you saw it here first. <laughs> Why don't they make them all the same size? A note in this company's catalog says that for almost 90 years, player pianos have entertained, mystified, and delighted people of all ages. I couldn't have said it better. Player pianos are vacuum operated. The piano roll is drawn past a tracker bar, which contains a small hole corresponding to each note on the piano. When a hole in the paper exposes a hole in the tracker bar, a small bellows pushes the corresponding note on the piano. Almost everyone seen a player piano, and we tend to think of them as old-fashioned. But the QRS company in Buffalo, New York, has been happily making piano rolls every business day since the turn of the century, from oldies to Beatles and the current top 40. Although they admit the invention of radio in the 20s gave them quite a scare, business has recovered nicely. There are two traditional ways to create a piano roll. This is one of them. I'm playing the Melville Clark marking piano. A lot of famous people have sat on this bench, and I was in too much awe of that fact to even touch the piano, but I drew the short straw. My apologies to those who have sat before. The marking piano is connected by small air hoses to a unit with a roll of paper in it. As the keys on the piano were pushed, small, stiff wires poke away at the paper. No holes are cut, the paper is traveling over a piece of carbon paper, and blue marks are being drawn on the underside. These marks can be cut out with a knife to become a piano roll recording of the pianist's performance. Closer study of most rolls suggests that they must have been recorded by a person with three or four hands. We met him. This is Rudy Martin at the QRS recording piano. I quickly counted his fingers. Only 10, but with this machine, he can appear to have more. The piano is connected by air hoses again to a punching machine. The punching machine will punch a hole corresponding to any note that's held on the keyboard. These rolls aren't played in real time. A foot pedal advances the paper row by row. At the moment, he's using a tempo that will require 12 rows of holes to pass for every beat in the measure. A slower ballad might require up to 30 rows of holes per beat. Long duration notes are punched as a stream of individual holes. In the final roll, the holes will pass quickly enough to sound as a continuous note. If long slots were cut, the effect would be the same, but the roll would fall apart from all those slots. The pull-out buttons above the keyboard are Rudy's extra fingers. Pulling one out holds a note and leaves his fingers free to play other notes. This method of recording a roll is not for the fainted heart musician. Rudy can only hear this arrangement in his head, and he's not just copying the music as it's written either. See, it's only written for two hands. As Rudy put it, player pianos can do things people can't.
A machine with a tracker bar and set of punches will make duplicates of the master roll, and edits can be made with a knife and scotch tape. This tempo guide matches the 12 rows per beat used in the recording. He's not only checking for mistakes, but adding further embellishments. These days, finished master rolls are read into a computer for production and archival purposes. The marriage of piano rolls and computers isn't as strange as it might seem. Piano rolls are digital music from way back and have always had the digital advantage. Copies are identical to the originals. Editing can also be done on the computer. Here, he's changing a musical dum into a ba da dum The interface between the 1980s and the 1890s is done by a bank of electromagnets. In the old days, a tracker bar would be located here, reading the master roll. The electromagnets accomplish the same thing, covering and uncovering the ends of vacuum hoses. The uncovering of a hose causes a small bellows to pull a wire. The paper punches bounce up and down continuously. When a punch is pulled by its wire, it engages and punches a hole in the roll. There are actually 16 rolls being punched at once by each punch, and four punching machines being run simultaneously from the same computer. Paper is fed from big spools. One of these spools feeds the bottom sheet, which is a heavier paper that gives a base for the punches. It'll be discarded. The paper's advanced in precise amounts through the punches. Next, the rolls are trimmed for easy spooling on the player and the label goes on. Now, the tab that attaches to the take-up spool on the piano is added. Well, this may not seem like a big deal, but the tabs are made here, too. This machine's been making about a million tabs a year since the turn of the century. It still works perfectly. Too bad this company didn't make cars. Lyrics for the songs are printed right on the roll and can be sung as they pass the tracker bar. The finished rolls are boxed and labeled. Company legend states that the operation began as a small part of the Melville Clark Piano Company around 1900. Orders for rolls were stuffed in the seldom used Q section in the mailroom. As orders increased, they spilled over to the R and then the S section and became known as the QRS orders. The piano roll has lasted longer than any other standard for recording and reproducing music, and an 80-year-old roll will still sound the same today as the day it was punched. Entertaining, delighting, and mystifying people of all ages. You know, driving around this car at highway speeds would be pretty exciting. As a matter of fact, I had a car built like this. At least it felt like it was built like this. Over the last 20 years, cars have steadily gone faster and straighter down the road with more comfort and traction and less vibration than noise. My ordinary sedan of the 80s easily outhandles my sports car from the 60s. It's been a sneaky revolution. I didn't fully realize how much cars had changed until I visited a wheel alignment training center. I was asking about front end alignment. They quickly brought me up to date by shouting at me. While the exact alignment of the front wheels is still important, the rear wheel alignment has to be taken into account as well. Let's go back to the 60s for a second. The reasons for proper wheel alignment haven't changed. 
good handling in tire life. But changes in tire technology have led to most of us riding around town on $1,000 worth of rubber. So the incentive for proper alignment is greater. The front wheels of a vehicle can't be perfectly perpendicular in all planes. To counteract forces at highway speeds, the tires are pointed inwards a bit. It's called toe-in. When toe-in set correctly, the tires will point straight ahead when the vehicle's moving. Now, incorrect toe wears tires. Camber is similar to toe-in, but in another plane. It's the tilt from the up and down perpendicular. Incorrect camber settings cause pulling in one direction and tire wear. The third biggie is caster. You can study the effects of caster by studying a caster. The fact that this shaft is set back makes the wheel follow the direction of travel. It's the caster on a car that returns the steering to the center when you let go of the wheel. Caster works tilted forwards or backwards. Some vehicles specify a slight forward caster for power steering and a slight backwards caster for manual steering. The effect of wrong caster is wild handling from too little and hard steering from too much. Incorrect caster is the only situation that doesn't wear tires. Now, when all of this is correct, the car will still veer off the road, but it's not the car's fault. Roads are curved for water runoff. A proper alignment will compensate for that. The compensation can be done with toe-in, but it's preferable to tweak the caster settings because caster doesn't affect tire wear. The biggest changes to vehicles have been the proliferation of front-wheel drive and unibody construction. These cars no longer have frames, and the individual wheel components are bolted to the body. This makes the integrity of the body part of the alignment. It's important to understand the concept that the rear wheels actually control the direction of the car, and the front compensates for the rear wheels. So the inspection starts at the back of a car. This is a McPherson strut. It's found now in most cars. The upper end of the strut is bolted to the body. Front wheel drive has an interesting wrinkle. Since one drive shaft on a sideways engine is shorter than the other, that wheel gets power a little later than the one with the longer shaft. To compensate for that effect, the wheel with the shorter drive shaft is set back on the car a bit. Also, smaller cars have smaller wheels that have to turn faster, so the alignment biz is getting pretty high tech. This particular alignment equipment uses light beams to measure the angles on all four wheels. Today's lighter cars have more varied specifications. So a barcode strip encodes these for each different make and model. As the machine goes through various steps, it instructs the operator to twist the front wheels for the next step.
as it turns out, the adjustment required on our test car was left rear toe. There's one more adjustment on a car that greatly affects the handling, ride, and life of your tires. Good news is you can make the adjustment yourself. You get a $5 tire pressure gauge and follow the directions that come with it and use information in your owner's manual. Maybe that's what's wrong with this car. I grew up with television. One of the great things about the early days of television was because of the limited number of channels, everybody watched the same thing at the same time. So after bedtime, I could hear the sound of our TV set and see the picture that went with it on the neighbor's TV set through binoculars. One of the shows that really fascinated me in the early days was Romper Room. At the end of every show, the host would take her magic mirror and look right out into the audience. I see Betty and, and Sue and Fred and David. Well, after I signed the contracts for Acme, that was the first thing I checked into, getting a magic mirror. Whew, are those babies expensive? The production manager said, just maybe, if I had a show that ran for hundreds of episodes and had a schmillion viewers, just maybe we could talk about a magic mirror. Well, I must have looked pretty heartbroken because she approved the funds for a hardware store mirror. Let's try it. I see the wall. Oh, I see Stu. He's a producer director. He built this lovely table. <laughs> and, uh, oh, there's Roger. Normally, uh, Roger's camera has a magic mirror on the front of it itself that lets me see my script. But this is a short item, so I just have that classic cue card. And uh, there's Gunars. He listens to everything I say. And there's Tom. He's a grip. He carried all this stuff up here, including Gunars. And uh, let's see. Oh, there's John, sitting in for Donna, who's on vacation. <laughs> she does all the work. He gets the glory. I wonder what those fingers mean.